Hey guys, I'm back with a new project. I'm working in my billiard room today and I will give you a tour. But first, I want to explain what I'm working on. I have a mirror that I am putting up on a very large wall and the mirror itself is very large and it is kind of being transplanted. It was originally in our master bath and now it is down here in the billiard room. So I'm going to show you the process of how I hung it as well as how I am framing it. Um, and this could potentially benefit someone who wants to frame their own mirrors in their house that are kind of frameless. Okay, so here is our billiard room. And it was originally supposed to be a living room, I believe, but it was open to our den, so that seemed kind of like overkill. So we decided to repurpose the room for something else. And I had wanted it to be like an executive style office. My husband wanted a pool table, so he won. And that's okay because the compromise was he had to pick a pool table that matched our furniture and didn't have like green felt at the top. That was like my big no-no. Basically, we had this massive wall. Just to kind of give you an idea, this room measures about 14 feet long. And I didn't want to put a whole lot of art because this is the view when you walk in. See, you got this um, light that sort of obstructs the view. So I wanted to keep it simple. And I know that, you know, mirrors are pretty simple. You don't have to worry about the view being obstructed, um, at least for art. <laughs> um, and we had had this mirror in our master bath. It is massive. And uh, it actually looked way bigger in our master bedroom. But when we brought it down here, it was um, a lot more small. But I still have to trim it out, and that's going to add to the width and length, and that's going to make it look really lovely. And that's what I'll be filming today. Um, let's see. Is there anything else to say about that? Oh, yeah. We're using 3M picture frame hooks. Um, each one was rated for 4 pounds of weight, so I got 92 pounds worth of The wood I'm using, this is a chair rail, actually, and it's from Home Depot. And it's solid wood, and um, you're going to want to go through the stack, and you're going to find yourself the best-looking pieces because you don't want one that's all dented up. Um, but basically, it's probably about two and a half to three inches wide, which is, I think, perfect for the length and width of this mirror that we're trimming out. Um, and here's another tip on when you are picking out wood that you, you know, want to use ornamentally. Um, you want it to be square. So meaning that um, there's no bends or like, you know, bulges in it. Um, and a lot of times, you know, wood, when it absorbs moisture, it can start to bow a little bit. One of the tests that you can do on the floor of your Home Depot or your Lowe's is this test. You set it down on the floor and look for gaps. If every part of that wood touches the floor and nothing's bowing or bending or risen, then you will have a very nice square piece of wood. As you can see, mine comes up just a little bit right here, but not a whole lot, like not even like a quarter of a quarter of an inch, whatever that terminology is. Um, so that was really good. Um, and then another thing to check is this. Lay it down flat and see if it touches the floor. So over here, we have a lot of play, right? So it's bowed in this corner. Now that part doesn't bug me as much because I am going to be nailing this to the wall so it's going to sort of force this frame to behave and go where I want it to go. But because it's a little more bowed on this end than it is on the other end, I am actually going to use that as my waist and I'm going to cut somewhere along there. That way I don't have to worry about dealing with the super bowed part at the end. And just so you know, you're going to go through a lot of wood to try to find the more square, less bowed pieces. Um, so don't get discouraged by that. I think I went through about like 13 before I found three that I could use. And this is not the perfect one, but at the same time, I just wanted to show you, you know, what you could be dealing with. So this part right here, it's going to get cut somewhere along the part where it starts to raise up and it's not going to give me too much of trouble. Um, so there's some important tips on choosing the right wood. So gashes, bowing, and whether it's square. So do the floor test and do the visual test. In addition to the other pieces of trim, I've got this um, trim as well. 
It's really small, hand for scale. And basically this is the piece that's going to sit kind of along the inside of the other trim piece. And it's gonna kind of cover the edge of the mirror. Now I have my measurements and now it's time to measure and mark my board. So on these um, frames, the width, the thicker side is usually going to be the um, exterior. And then the thinner side is usually gonna go into the um, interior. So this will be the outside and this will be the part that touches the mirror. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark my board, measure very carefully with my measuring tape. And I'm going to use pencil um, because that will give me um, the ability to mark it without digging deep into the wood and creating any sort of blemish. And I will be using this um, regular Black & Decker measuring tape to um, figure out my exact coordinates. Before I can measure, I need to get my edge right. So I'm going to create a 90 degree angle at the very, very tip of this board so as not to have a lot of waste. So that's what's next. If you've watched my other videos, then you recognize this baby. This is the Stanley little saw and um, I guess uh, marking board. I'm not really sure what you would call this thing, but it allows you to cut perfect 90 degree angles and other various angles as well as straight cuts because you will slide your saw in between these um, slits after you align your wood. And that will basically allow you to get that angle that you need. Um, so this thing obviously takes longer than a power tool, but because I am not really that comfortable with those tools yet, I'm using this because it works. One of the things that I wanted to hint on is that you will be dealing with a lot of sawdust, so obviously the preferred place is outdoors. It's kind of cold outside, and I just thought that I would do it in the house because it just works better for me. So I've got my board lined up to the 90 degree edge there as close as I could get it. You see that line? This is the line, and I want to edge it up close to there, so that way I'm not wasting. And now I've got these pegs that come with this and it's going to help secure the board from sliding. So I'm gonna place them in the closest and tightest spot. Okay, those things help a bit, so don't forego them. Next, I'm going to take my saw and I am going to find a slat. So using these slats as guides, I will be able to create a perfect 90 degree angle on this wood and the, the um, pegs will help to hold the wood still, but I'm also going to hold it somewhere here, far away from the blade, to even stabilize it further. have this edge and it's going to need a slight sanding to get it perfect but it's not bad and it takes a little longer than a power saw but at the same time this is a lifesaver for me or else I wouldn't be doing a lot of these projects so I can't highly recommend this enough um, I just love it okay so I need to measure starting from this mark down to seven feet and two ticks which is what I determined the bottom width and the top width were and so when you're measuring a really long distance, then obviously, and, and the edge is not very good here, I'll need to go ahead and use some tape to get my um, the edge of my measuring tape to stay. So I'll be securing this thing to this little spot right here with some tape so I know that my measurement is accurate. Okay, so I got it marked and I got it lined up. Now we can't use that same slot that we used last time because it's going to create the wrong angle. This is the mark that needs to be cut and it needs to go outward this way. So we have to use these slats now in order to get the right angle. So you're gonna to wanna to do your best, so you find your 45 degree angle, and then we're gonna do your best to line the part that needs to be cut at the line or the slot area where the saw is gonna go. I was starting to saw my wood when this guy decided to come and hang out with Mama. Um, he didn't make this mess. That was my Yorkie that pulled all her toys out of the toy box and pulled all the stuff in out of the toys. Well, anyway, Hammy's sleeping and he's had a rough day because he had a tummy ache and I had to give him some medicine. 
and I hate to saw and wake the poor baby up. But I love you, Haley. You're so cute. It's my shadow. Just testing it to make sure it lines up properly. And, oh, I just moved it. Ha, huh, but it does. So this is good to go. I got my first piece of wood cut. On to the next. Okay, so I've got my top and my bottom cut, and now I'm working on the sides. So since the sides are significantly shorter than the top and the bottom, you can usually get away with using one piece of wood. And that will allow for less waste and less money spent. Um, so just to kind of give you a quick tip from a mistake that I made the very first time I ever did this project, well, cutting wood, is that we already know that you start with your edge cut, right? because you measure from the inside corner on down to the length that you need. So let's just say it's here. You're gonna cut from here to here, theoretically, for your project. And now you have on this side, this angle, when you actually need this angle. This is waste right here. Don't make the mistake of thinking you can count this length. You can't, because you're gonna recut this angle to start and then measure from from this inside corner on down to, you know, make that angle again, the 45. So just be sure that you are really careful when you're measuring to make sure that you don't have, um, like, well, make sure that you have enough. Okay, as I mentioned previously, before you can truly measure your trim so that you can mark it and cut it, you need to first start with this angle. So the first thing we did was we cut this angle onto one side. And then we had measured from this shorter end on down in order to find our mark. Well, the reason we did the shorter end is because that first thick piece of trim was gonna go around the exterior of the mirror. So it needed to be able to envelope the mirror. Um, so the important takeaway from this is that um, in my project, I'm using this actual piece of the trim, the thinner trim, to fit inside of the other trim. And so now, in order to make that measurement, I have to, of course, as usual, cut my angle. And then I'm gonna measure from the long side down to make my mark so that I can cut it. And that is because anytime you measure for something that's sitting on the inside, you need to have the longest measurement taken into consideration. When it's on the exterior, it's the shortest. Hope that makes sense. A very rough workstation setup. I got this old sheet protecting my countertop and all the pieces of wood have been cut and verified on the wall that they do fit. And what I'm going to do is just take this very fine sandpaper and just kind of go first over the edges and then over anywhere that's not smooth. Um, and then I will be ready to condition the wood. And that is something that you apply to wood that will precede stain so that the stain goes on more evenly. So I'll show you as I do that next. The product I'm using, it's the Minwax Pre-Stain Wood Conditioner. And it takes about two hours to dry before you can um, stain. And this just allows for the wood to penetrate more consistently the color of your stain. Um, and they basically say in the directions that you put it on, allow it to penetrate for 5 to 15 minutes, remove the excess with the clean dry cloth, and then wait two hours before you stain. So that's what we're doing next. Because I'm nailing these directly into the wall and I don't want a whole lot of vibrations on the wall with the glass right next to it, I went ahead and just pre-drove the nails all the way through and then pulled them out carefully because that way it will be a lot less resistance when it comes time to hang these. Um, unless, of course, I hit a stud. If I hit a stud in the wall, then obviously I'll get some more vibration, but this will just help to eliminate some of that vibration when I'm hammering. Excuse this awful looking can, but obviously it's been used quite a few times. The color I'm using is Minwax Gel Stain Mahogany, and what I'm applying it with is this brush. It came from Walmart. It's the Linzer Stain and Varnish Polyester Bristle Blend. For all stains and varnishes so you don't want to get a regular paintbrush it will not work you want to get a um, stain brush so this is what the brush looks like and it applies the stain properly and it doesn't lose bristles and it doesn't end up like sticking 
to the um, surface so it's perfect for the job so let's go ahead and start that um, some people may elect to use like a sock um, I find that I prefer the brush application method I forgot to mention earlier is you really want to wear some gloves this stuff gets on your skin and it is really tough to get off so I just want to show you from this view as I go so far it's looking really nice so the key is to prevent the drips from drying you want to keep it nice and smooth and thin you can always go back and put another layer um, if need be for you know to darken the color but you do not want to end up with excess product that drips and um, ends up like, you know, creating a drip effect, which makes it look cheap. You know, you paid money for your wood, you paid money for your product. You obviously take pride in your property, so what's the point of rushing it, right? I feel like I'm kind of preaching to myself as I tell you. Sometimes I do have the negative habit of rushing through things, and I find that when I take my time and put a lot of love and thought into a project, I'm so much happier with the outcome for the long term. So I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing, and I'm going to make sure I get in those lines real deep, and um, then it's going to dry. It usually takes a good... 24 hours to dry. The reason I'm doing this indoors, by the way, is because it's less than 60 degrees outside. Anything below 60, you're not going to dry. Um, so I would recommend that you, you know, um, either do this in the spring or summer or do it like in a well ventilated place in your home um, where, you know, you can make sure that you're not too exposed to the fumes. Okay, so my first piece is done and it's drying. Um, I'm going to move on to the next, but just to kind of give you an idea that the brush gives it a nice, deep, thick coverage using it the first time. Sometimes if you use like the cloth or the sock, it ends up, um, you know, wiping a lot off. So that's one reason why I prefer the brush method. Um, obviously with stain, it's a wood grain, you're going to end up with imperfections and inconsistencies to an extent. But just use gentle, broad brush strokes and keep blending, blending, blending. Like I was saying earlier, it looks like it's a lot more wet in those um, grooves. But the truth is that I went in with that brush and smoothed it out real good. So I'm confident that it won't be too dark in the grooves. I got everything coated and now it's all drying. I'm going to give it overnight to dry before I mess with it again. I'm going to check to see in the morning if it needs any more coats and if it dried evenly. My wood has dried and um, I wanted to go ahead and place it in its respective spots. So this piece right here will be the bottom. So I'm going to be lining it up against here and then I'm going to be mailing it directly into the wall. It's not going to go over the glass, it's just going to butt up against it. And that's the way I'm choosing to hang this. Those smaller trim pieces are going to go and kind of cover the edges, but you'll see that in just a moment. So I got my first piece up. And I butted it up directly under the mirror and I put a few extra nails for just added support in case the strips ever become unengaged from the wall. And um, what I used was some really thin nails with a tiny head. And that way um, I could like kind of easily hide it in the frame. And I'm going to go back in any spot that you kind of see more noticeably that I bumped with the hammer. Um, I am going to cover that with a little bit more stain just to kind of hide it. So one of the things that um, helps when you use these itty bitty little heads is that when you're hammering and you get close to the wood, rather than um, hammer all the way into the wood, you can take, let me see if I can do this without messing up, you can take one nail and just kind of, sorry, 
ram it or, or, or tap the <clears throat> tap the first nail in with the second nail using the hammer to kind of tap it real gently and that's going to drive it in and that way you don't have to put that hammer up against that wood and you keep the wood nice and keep it from getting um, bashed by the hammer so the next thing is the sides so i got the two side pieces up but i only nailed at the bottom because i want the top to move just slightly so that i can adjust it for when i put the um the very top brace on all right now for the final the top so this is where i'll figure out if it all came together or if i have to <laughs> remake some cuts sometimes in spite of your best efforts you just can't get it perfect you know Four sides are up and then I went back with my um, little stain brush and covered the spots that had gotten like maybe a little bit of stain knocked off or um, just needed to be filled in a little bit. So this is what we got so far. So I got the trim pieces still coming in but they're drying because one thing that I discovered when I was testing it earlier is that when you put the small pieces of trim up against the mirror you can see the back of them reflecting back at you. And the problem was that I could see that I hadn't stained the back fully. So I went ahead and stained the back of those trim pieces and now they're drying. So that's a really good tip for anyone who's attempting to do a project like this. Stain the back of your pieces that go or butt up against a mirror so that you don't see the ugly unstained backside. All right, final product. I got the inner trim done, and the adhesive of choice was hot glue. I tried a couple different things, but hot glue just basically worked the best, um, especially if I had to like remove and rehang. So this is what it looks like with the inner trim. It's pretty seamless. Um, there's the detail. But basically, um, I just love the way this came out. I don't think it could have came out any more perfect. It was such a great reuse of a material that we weren't going to be using for much longer and um, saved me a ton of money because buying a mirror of this size would have been probably close to $500 on um, the furniture market. But uh, you can't tell that it wasn't something that was bought at a nicer furniture store because it looks professional, if I may say so. And I'm loving the um, light that it adds when you walk in. So I'll give a shot of the room with it done. All right, this is the shot of the room with it done. And in case you're wondering, the pool table is a little bit off center. Um, the light is center and the mirror is center. The pool table is a little off center because of the clearance between the window and the pool table. But um, anyway, I'm loving it. Looks great. Really excited. And I hope that my journey and my mistakes and everything I learned in this project will help the next person. Thanks for tuning in.